Buenos Nachos Amigos, and welcome to Record Breakers, your favorite music review show, or your, at least your fourth favorite, maybe fifth favorite, I don't know. Uh, we, I am Petey Rave, your man with no plan. Here with me are my team, my co compatriots. Uh, we got none other than Brett. Uh, is, is rude but cool. Give me a break. Uh, Drew. Hey. And we got Patrick. Is a party dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I, nothing rude, but uh, yes. Uh, we are gathered once again to talk about music. Uh, here to provide us the music for this week is none other than Patrick. Patrick, what do you got for us this week? So uh, I'm gonna do the thing where I pick one of my favorite albums of all time. I don't know if I can call it the, but it's it's top three. Uh, it's a band called Faith No More, and their sort of breakout album, The Real Thing. Um, Faith No More are that band that, you know, most people maybe have heard of, but they mostly have heard one song. So I figured the re- you guys should hear the rest of this. Mm-hmm. It is it is the band that you know that one song from, and then here's the album. Uh, let's ask expectations. Brett, what were your expectations coming into this album? Um, I, I knew the song. We will get to that later. Um, <laughs> the actual song of, of no, uh, but I knew the song still gets played every day on rock radio in my city. Um, it, I did not ever have any reason to dig deeper. I, I did not think that it was worth mining the depths to find the, the golden in their hills. Um, but, uh, yeah, I had zero expectations of anything other than more of what I heard on the radio. Mm-hmm. Uh, Drew, what were your expectations coming into this album? Spoiler alert, I've also heard Epic. Um, and also, spoiler, it gets played on all rock radio stations all the time. Um, so that's, I sort of knew them from that. I had heard bits and pieces, but not really anything of note, but that's, that's the song you know, so it's what you know. Um, I went into it with very little expectations. Um, besides that, I guess. So. Yeah. I've heard two songs of this album before we listen to this. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. we got a badass over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but let's get into Patrick. What were the, what would be the themes on this? What, what make, what makes this album tick? So, Faith No More kind of bridge, in my mind, at least time-wise, the gap between 80s thrash and 90s alternative and grunge. They're kind of, they have elements of both, and they kind of, their core of their career fit in between the two periods. This album came out in 1989, um, and it, the song Epic, as as has already been mentioned, is the song everyone's heard. Had a clever video, and, and Bjork's fish flopped around on the floor at the end and pissed off a lot of people. But... After that, I guess no one other than Faith No More fans ever kept listening. Uh, Faith No More is mostly, I think, known for their lead singer, Mike Patton, who uh, does like everything he can in music for better or worse. He's kind of crazy, but in like a good way. Um, but the, the band was started by uh, Roddy Bottom, Billy Gold, Mike Borden, who are the, uh, the bassist, keyboard slash synth player and drummer. Uh, this album, it's it's got sort of fusion of many sort of sounds into what is otherwise kind of an alternative metal record. It's a little bit, you know, after thrash metal, it's a little bit early alternative rock. It's got a little bit of funk in there. Uh, they're epic. If you've heard it, the lyrics are, are half wrapped and that was kind of a thing because prior to this, it was pretty much the only things that had been rap and rock at the same time were Anthrax and Public Enemy or Aerosmith and Run DMC. So they're cited for better or worse by a lot of new metal bands as, as an influence. Uh, but this record, it, it sold pretty well in like 89 and 90. The Epic video made its rounds and then they kind of just went on to being a band who released a whole bunch more records, broke up and then got back together and supposedly are releasing a new record in the spring, which makes me very excited. Uh, Pat, uh Brett. What? <laughs> Whoa there. Uh, Brett. Patrick, what was... repeat everything you just said. <laughs> Say more. Uh, Brett, what would be the themes on albums that stood out to you? What, what, what caught your attention on this album? 
Um, I wouldn't call it so much rap. I would call it talk singing. And it's my belief that talk singing only works if you're singing One Night in Bangkok. Um, but, uh, there, there was a definite penalty to this album for, uh, illegal use of MIDI. Um, there, there was some, uh, there's some, like, turn of the, uh, of the decade keyboard sounds that were kinda a little bit like you're playing Final Fantasy, but, like, Final Fantasy the original. Um, the, the bass work was very, very admirable, but I don't think it carried the album for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Drew, speaking of bass work, what, what were the themes and elements that stood out for you? Well, um, as a bassist, I very much like the bass work on this album. Um, I think it was the strong point. Um, also the keys, um, keyboard player, uh, was Body bottom. fantastic bottom, right? Yeah. I always, um, can never remember if it's bottom or Bowden, uh, which one's the keyboard player, but, um, but the bottom played some great keyboard work. To me though, I've never, like, the reason I didn't check more into Faith No More when I heard Epic was the, the vocal stylings. Um, I'm not a huge fan of what Mike Patton was doing. Um, it, there was some good parts where, where it was at, but overall, not a huge fan, and it sort of diminished the rest of what they had for me personally. Um, but, like Brett said, the bass work was really, really great. Um, and, Unlike him, I actually kind of like the keyboard work, the synth work. Um, so I was down for that, but vocals not exactly my cup of tea. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, I kind of have to agree with that. Uh, Patrick, what would be the key tracks uh, to to key in on? So, so I'll, I'll mention Epic. I I still like this song. Yes, it's played every day on stupid radio everywhere, but there's a reason for it. It's kind of a decent song. Uh, the stuff I really like, it's kind of, the album has some like weird sort of slightly proggy turns, like, uh, the title track, The Real Thing. It's like eight and a half minutes of weird. It has a really great drum intro, uh, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of just really good, you know, bass work. Uh, Jim Martin, the guitar player who, uh, went on to grow gigantic pumpkins for a living after, after he left the band, uh, can't make that shit up. Um, it's pretty good on this record at being Jim Martin. Uh, he was kind of the metal head of the group and sort of brought that element into it. Uh, another one I really, the more I listen to it, the more I like it is Underwater Love. It's got just a really, a really good sound and a, and a, probably one of the catchier songs on it. And then the final song on the record, Edge of the World, which is kind of this weird piano-y, loungy thing that they just did at the end that kind of sounds like nothing else. It's creepy and it's kind of cool. Uh, Brett, what would be some of the key tracks for you? Um, I, straight up, Woodpecker for Mars. Um, again, can't make it up. Uh, it, it, it was almost an amazing song. Um, it, it had signed kind of some cheese going on back, on, on the back. Like, this album did something that is really respectful. They had songs that were more than three minutes long. Um, that, that, that is not something that you did. And that when they were in 1989, uh, when you're making this album, uh, but like there was some groove to it. Uh, like there, I had a whole lot of uh, fun with, uh, surprise you're dead. Um, and also looked up how many video games that that song has been put into. Um, <laughs> uh, because I've, I've heard that song before, did not know that it was from this album. Um, it must have been a rock band or a guitar hero or something. But, uh, you know, it, I, I really hate the fault it for the cheesy keyboards. Like, uh, you know, the opening track, the, the, as soon as you, uh, you, you get into it, you're like, okay, this is like a weird transitional period in music. We haven't yet hit the, the flannel wearing grunge stage. We're still wearing like hot pink and like pastels and, uh, not knowing what cool is yet. And who knows? This could have been like a style that, that took off the crazy, like MIDI is only hilarious because it was abandoned whole cloth like a year later. But you know, like it, th- there was some really good base work. I, you know, 
on Epic, I really, I, it's, I, I'm glad that that's the song that they chose to latch onto as their single because, like, you know, to ask the the question of of what is it, um, and it answers it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it. Um, and and like for like the next fifty years, somebody's gonna be hearing that song on like old timey radio from the early nineties. Uh, so I. I don't want to completely like take a big old dump on this album, but like there, there's, there is some gold in them. There hills, if if you dig far enough. There hills, if if you dig far enough. Uh, Drew, what is your? What were some of the key tracks for you? Um, well, Epic started out. Um, it had nice swells, sort of a great tone throughout. The chorus was pretty solid, although the sort of like nasally thing that Pat does, I'm not a huge fan of, as I said. But the verse absolutely killed um, most of the fun I was having with that one. Um, War Pigs, I'm going to touch on the cover a little bit. Um, they keep it pretty straight um, all together. Usually you see bands doing one of two things with covers, which is they change the style of it into their own and sort of push it forth which is what a lot of ska and punk bands do. Um, or the singer does something on top of it and adds a bit into it. So when I heard the song and it sounded pretty like close in style to the original, I was worried they were going to add a rap part to it. Really glad they didn't. <laughs> or I would have I would have traveled across Pennsylvania to punch Swagger in the head. Um, I'm not a monster, Drew. I'm not a monster. I, I think I that is the been. the second best War Pigs cover I've ever heard on an album, the best being Cake. Which, if you want to hear Cake play War Pigs, just picture Cake playing War Pigs in your head. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's awesome. <sighs> yeah, as you were I'm saying, true. <laughs> But um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with um, what Brett pointed out as well. Um, Woodpecker from Mars, the instrumental. Um, one, notice the word I said, instrumental. Um, the the layering was really good on this track. Um, from the keys to the bass to the guitar work, it was all really, really well done. Um, and it was really had this cool melodic groove to it, which is kind of cool. It's what I imagine like. It's a weird picture in my mind, but it's whenever I imagine like the stoner like laying on the floor with their big giant headphones like tripping out the music, like it's stuff like Woodpecker from Mars that I'm imagining them listening to. And like that's just sort of a cool trippy thing uh, that I I actually really enjoyed that one. Um and that to me was actually the highlight of the album was Woodpecker from Mars. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, it, it, it's some interesting tracks. Woodpecker from Mars. That's just that's 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 a hell of a title for you, uh, to say the least. Uh, let's go back around home, uh, Brett. What would be your thoughts on the album overall? Can I have conclusive thoughts? Um, it, it's uh, exactly what the early '90s, late '80s gave us. It was like hair metal was out. Uh, Van Halen was old. Um, rap music was still in the and the chicken tastes like wood era, and uh, nobody really knew what they were doing yet. Yeah, there were some guys making noise in Seattle, and there were some some other things a brewing. But like, this was I, I can't fault them for not being on the same track that everybody else was, seeing that you know it was such a transitional time. Uh, but man, there's some of this album that's just silly as shit. Like it's it's like it's giggle worthy. Some of the stuff that's in this album. Um, but you know, I also listen to bands that sing about flying spaceships into black holes, which is giggle worthy. So, uh, you know, if if you're into something, uh, if you want to find something that you're probably not going to just happen upon, and you want to listen to something that uh, is a piece out of time, grab this album, listen to it. You might not have as, the same problems that I do. Uh, but it's definitely worth listening to, uh, especially for a band that gets that much airtime th- this far into the future from when they they cut this album. You know, it's it's worth twenty five damn years ago. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Drew, what would be your thoughts on the album overall? Um, overall, the music. 
words are not exactly my strong suit. The musicianship was really fantastic. Um, again, uh, the Patton voice thing, wasn't a huge fan of it in Mr. Bungle. Not a huge fan of it here. Um, but if you are, and you are a fan of that more toxing, rapping sort of thing that they're doing here, it's a really solid record um, from a music standpoint. So, I mean, like Brett said, if Epic gets played how much yeah. across at least this nation, not including any others, like, it, you need to listen to it. You need to listen to stuff like this, this just to know where, like, the one-hit wonder people are and what more that they have to offer because it's not fair. Yeah. Technically speaking, Faith No More have another song everybody heard. It's a really? song called We Care A Lot. It is the theme song to Dirty Jobs. It's from an album or two before this with a different lead singer. That's the yes. other one everyone knows. And they really only know the cool bass like lick in it. <laughs> all you hear in the Dirty Jobs theme. But, and uh, it's a dirty job. It's from, it's from a song called We Care A Lot, which is actually a pretty decent song on its own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, okay. and it's definitely an interesting album and time uh, in space uh, with uh, the, the guys. It, it, Mike Patton does a weird, sticky, nasally voice thing, which is a shame because you, if you, you... Love or hate, I will, I will give everyone that. Either you love Mike Patton or you hate him, and there is a mode, lot of people... In this mode, yeah, you either love or hate in this mode. But the thing is that it, he is a really talented singer. Uh, and he actually has a large range and can do a lot of things vocally uh, as a talent. He just doesn't show it here. <laughs> he doesn't really show it here. And he's doing a very specific shtick. So. But outside of that, it's a lot of really cool stuff to, to be found throughout. And, and uh, aside from that song. Uh, th- uh, by the way, the other song, I, I teased it. The other song I knew was uh, Falling to Pieces. That was the other song. Which is a good one. I like falling song. to pieces. Uh, but yeah, Patrick, what would be your thoughts on the album overall? Your, your rebuttal. <laughs> so, so my my rebuttal is I I I admittedly uh am, am a Patton fan. I like a lot of bands. There's a lot of uh a lot of the uh the sort of post hardcore scene got influenced by them. Uh, specifically, a band everyone here hated, Glassjaw. Uh, they they cite Faith No More. There's a lot of bands. Faith No More is your favorite band's favorite band. They're that kind of a thing where a lot of musicians really like them, and a lot of bands would call them a band they they either listen to or are influenced by, but you've never really, you know, most people have never heard more than a few songs. And I think for that, I mean, that's the, like, many things. Like, go listen to it because it is a piece of time. It is it is a transition in music. It wasn't, it doesn't fit into any of, any one single, you know, rock genre kind of, expands across a few and like i said i've been listening to this album for 15 plus years you know i've 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 bought it in like middle school and it's been one that stuck with me and you know i guess part of that's nostalgia and part of that i think it is a good rock record yeah your favorite band's favorite band, like musicians, musicians, or baseball players, baseball players, or football players, football players. It can be a double-edged sword, like having mm-hmm. trying to listen to the aristocrats as an actual joke. <laughs> uh, because it's a joke for people who have, are uh, desensitized to all other humor. <laughs> so it's like, it can be great, or it can be, okay, yeah, uh, we got it. This is what you enjoy, but it's for you. Uh, but yeah, uh Sorry for taking the last word, but yeah, there you go. Uh, the that is our, our thoughts. We're going to now get into the main event of the evening. What we're all been waiting for. We are our haiku reviews. Uh, let's get started. I'll start with Drew. What is your haiku? Considered classic, but wasn't my cup of tea. Bass and keys were key. Mm-hmm. I'll go second. Uh, occasionally, good stuff can be found throughout, aside from that song. I'm, I mean, as well in, as in, not just that song. We're, we're picking up where you're laying down, Petey. We get I, you. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't quite... <laughs> okay. Uh, Brett, what is your haiku? Lost sound of music. Sound that's lost to the ages... It's old new metal. 
Oh, that hurt. Uh, <laughs> that hurt. Pat, what is your haiku? A perfect record from an underrated band. I love this too much. Mm-hmm. Uh... Yeah, that is our haikus. That's our thoughts and our haikus, and uh, that uh, puts a bow on that and ties it in a nice little ribbon. Uh, you can listen to this record on our Spotify playlist. Uh, let us know where else we can curate a playlist for you, but uh, at, we'll do it then there. But you can check this out on the Spotify playlist. Uh, you can also check out our next album, on there and that next album is brought to you by brett brett what is our album next week we're gonna take a heady trip back to 2001 to the uh transitional album by the band who everybody has heard of but probably hasn't listened to that much it is the album violence has arrived by the virtuosos in guar Mm. so guar's Violence has arrived. Yes. Uh, it's going to be an interesting talk. Uh, but that's it for another fine episode of Record Breakers. Uh, of course, you can find us all over the internet. Patrick is at the Swagger. Brett is at Hibbity Bibbird, H I B B B I B T H. One of them. Some letters followed by some other letters. Yes. Uh, they'll find me if they want me. Uh, Drew is at X Jucifer X. I'm at PD Rave. The show's at four record breakers, number four record breakers, recordbreakerspodcast.com, uh, rebelli.net. Check out all the shows. Uh, subscribe. Uh, like I said sub- before, uh, before, if you subscribe, you can see things ahead of time because I post them at nine o'clock in the morning. I only tell people on the social networks in the afternoon because I want to, I feel like waiting. I don't know, but you'll, you'll get it way before you'll find out about it on our social network. So subscribe, share, like, give us reviews. Uh, until next time, hasta los huevos. Tulu. Oh, I, I've got a story about the, uh, what's his name, Mike uh, Mike Patton. Um, mm-hmm. uh, my buddy who's like in his bedroom right now, uh, his family's from Eureka, California, and he has an uncle that uh, was in high school choir with Mike Patton. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, That's uh, that would be interesting. And uh, she was like, I don't know why he does he sings the way he does. <laughs> he is, well, I mean, because he has such a beautiful voice is what he's I, doing. Like, I mean, he's he's done everything. Like, he did a fucking Italian opera album because he can. Yeah, and, like, he's, he's, he is trained to be a singer. He's from, done video from, games. He's, he's, a, he's a freak over. of a singer. Yeah, no, and I think I he just doesn't want to sound like everybody else. I think that's always kind of been his game is he wants to sound like Mike Patton that's, wants to sound like Mike Patton. Which is And fine. that's why every like every time I said it, I made sure to say like I'm not a fan of it because no. he has he has great vocal control, like and you can tell. But it's just uh the thing isn't my cup of tea, I guess. I feel I feel like, you know, the 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 rub with this record was it was his first one with the band, he was like twenty. The vocals got better. <laughs> but then again, I like, you know, I like Mr. Bungle's first record, too. Mr. Bunghole? Have you ever listened to Mr. Bungle, Brett? I feel like you might actually, like, they're they're the kind of weird you like. Um, I, I don't subscribe to any, diff- like, specific kind of weird, so you may be correct. You um, may, you're I right. feel like I feel like... I may be crazy. But it ju- I just may be the lunatic that uh, you're looking for. There's there's less synth. Well, it, the the thing is, if it was actual synthesizer, like if they oh, went it's, and re- I mean, it's if, they re- if they recut this entire album, and and took out all of the keyboards and put in an actual like Wurlitzer Continental. What about if they put in even just modern? Soft no, you, you just worked. just put in anything. Put in a guy playing a kazoo. Like it, it would it actually sound real. Like it sounded so like, like sixteen bit, not even like. <laughs>